what is science? In this three-part talk, I'm going to try to answer that question. In part one, I'm going to be dealing with the scientific processes of observation and generalization. In part two, I'm going to talk about theories and hypotheses. And then in part three, I'm going to present a representation of the scientific method that seems to capture more of how scientists really do science. But before we get there, let's start with a basic representation of the scientific method. This is the wheel of science. Now it is a cycle, meaning that there isn't any particular starting point or end point, but I find it useful and informative to start with observation. What is observation from a scientific perspective? Well, let's take a step back and talk about epistemology. Epistemology is the philosophy of knowing. It covers all the different ways people can come to know things about the universe. And one branch of epistemology is positivism. The idea of positive, positivism is that there are natural phenomena that exist outside of subjective human experience, and we can know these. So, if a tree falls in a forest and nobody is there to hear it, does it make a sound? What would a positivist say? A positivist would say, I don't know. I don't know if it would make a sound. I guess we could see if there's already a scientific answer, or if there isn't, we can find out. Let's go find out. How do we do that? How do we find out if a tree makes a sound? Well, we need to make some observations. This is the idea of empiricism. We can know through observing. And so the scientific method is about knowing things about the natural world through making observations. Now, I'd like to give you one example of an interesting observation. This is a video from Periodic Videos. As you can see in the title, it's about exploding hydrogen bubbles. You've probably experienced something similar, maybe in a chemistry class, with exploding hydrogen balloons. And that's a very rapid and loud process. What happens in that brief moment? Well, the folks at Periodic Videos looked at hydrogen bubbles in slow motion, and, well, they made some interesting observations. Let's watch. I think the really important demonstration from the understanding of gases is how slowly gases spread in air. So even if you have some hydrogen that is not confined by anything, it really takes quite a long time for the hydrogen to spread out. And so this, if you like, challenges our idea that gases and things mix very quickly. Of course, eventually all gases will mix, but on the time scale of the video, everything is pretty slow. And so it is important to learn these lessons and to see how things behave. That was interesting. Sir Martin Polyakov noted that the shape of the hydrogen retained that bubble form long after it had escaped the bubble. And so when it met with that flame, it generally had the shape of the bubble. And that was surprising because, as it turns out, gases don't mix that quickly. At least hydrogen in atmosphere doesn't mix, mix that quickly at least on the time scale of a slow motion video. That was an interesting observation about a property of a gas. And observations like this can lead to general understandings of how gases work. And we arrive at these general understandings through describing the phenomena. And so a scientific description looks for common properties in phenomena, looks for patterns, and it seeks to describe those patterns in simple terms. This could be through simple language, or through diagrams, or perhaps mathematical equations. And then, if those patterns are consistent, they can be generalized. So perhaps observing that many gases tend not to mix very rapidly in atmosphere suggests that all gases tend not to mix very rapidly in atmosphere. And that's a generalization that can be 
tested. Now, to give an example of how descriptions can be generalized, let's stick with this topic of the behavior of gases. Imagine there's a steel box that's airtight, and in the middle is a divider. The divider is also airtight. On the left side is a gas. The red dots represent molecules of that gas. The right side is empty. It's a vacuum. What happens when the divider is removed? I think you can take a guess that it will do something like this. The gas will expand into the vacuum and be roughly equally distributed within that space. And of course, we could do this with many different gases. We could try different sizes and shapes of containers, and we would probably observe a similar phenomenon each time. And after a short while, we could generalize saying that, well, this is probably a, beha probably a behavior of all gases when it expands, when they expand into a vacuum. And so generalizing from specific observations to a broad class of a phenomenon involves what's called inductive logic. And this is an important part of describing scientific phenomena, understanding how phenomena behave more generally. Now, a general description of how gases behave is contained in the ideal gas law. I think you're familiar with this. The pressure times the volume of a gas equals the number of moles, which corresponds to the number of molecules, times the universal gas constant, times the temperature. And this is established for uh, gases. This is how gases behave. And you can, from this equation, estimate the pressure or the volume or the temperature based on knowing the other parameters. And so we know that the volume increased and we can rearrange the equation to predict how the pressure changed. Of course, N, the number of moles didn't change. The molecules are the same number as before. R, the universal gas constant is constant. It doesn't change. And we'll assume the temperature didn't change during this transition. We do know the volume increased by a factor of 2, and so a simple representation of how the pressure changed is 1 times 1 times 1 divided by 2, or 1 half. We can conclude that the pressure decreased by 1 half, and this is given a general understanding of gases based on a number of observations. Now what happens if we change the scenario, and instead of vacuum on the right, it's another gas. And then we remove the barrier as before. Well, you're probably guessing it does something kind of like this. The two gases don't just stay on their respective sides. They mix. How do they mix? What is the nature of that mixing? Well, the ideal gas law doesn't quite explain that entire process. There need to be other pieces of information, other general understandings of how gases work. And that collection of general understandings forms a theory. One example of a theory is the kinetic theory of gases, which does a good job of explaining on a macro level how gases behave, looking at uh, volumes of gas. So this example here, there are too few molecules. The kinetic theory of gases doesn't explain it. It assumes we're looking at a large number of molecules, but it does a good job explaining things like the mixing of gases, and it can explain why hydrogen bubbles retain the shape of the bubble after escaping from the bubble. And this theory comes from a collection of generalizations that were described. So observations are described, those lead to theories. Theories are the basis of making new predictions about unobserved phenomena. And this cycle goes on and on. Of course, I'm going to talk about theories and predictions in the second part of this lecture series. So go ahead and click the link in the description below. Also, if you'd like to watch the entire video on periodic videos, or any of their other videos, go ahead and uh, click that link in the description as well. I'll see you in the next lecture. Thank you.